All right, so this is one of my favorite charts by one of my favorite people. Um, so this is the, the famed Elijah Meeks, who um, did that post on the Gestalt principles of visualization. He, I think, again, is still currently a visualization engineer at Netflix, which is a pretty sweet title. He also wrote one of the more advanced and better books on D3. So if you want more D3 past the Scott Murray book, um, Elijah Meek's book, I'll put in the syllabus, um, but it's a book from Manning and it gets into some pretty awesome stuff. Um, this is probably one of my favorite D3 visualizations out there, mainly because it really straddles this line nicely between density and complexity of visualization and ease of interpretability through just really well chosen visual encodings and things like interaction. So this is actually a year's worth of um, weather data from New York. And we have things, if you can't read um, the little labels, it's things like the record, the average, this year, freezing, cloudy. Um, it's actually this radial plot, but with multiple different bands. So the whole outer radius is just things like, is it cloudy, is it rainy? The inner band is things like temperature. And then we get this. Um, brushability to get this little drill down window, which we can then see. Um, and this is really good um, to see these like outliers and extreme events. This is going to be more and more relevant as global warming gets worse and worse, I imagine. Um, but this is a cool example of some, it's, it's made in D3, so it's not totally grammar of graphics, but of this layered chart. Um, and can anyone, I kind of gave you the overview of what this is, think of or wants to pull out what, what's one layer here in terms of these four things, geometry, statistical transform, position, and aesthetic. So there's like five-ish layers. Mm -hmm. So the, the average, assuming that this is just the raw data, the average is statistical transform plus bar geometry plus um, polar coordinates. And then one more, one more layer in terms of those uh, geometry, statistical transform, position not super relevant, and then aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So I would say color is an aesthetic, and each layer has a different aesthetic. So how many colors does this use? Yes, lots. So there's lots going on here. There's lots of layers. Um, and the, the other thing that I didn't talk about abstractly because it, it makes more sense in code is the beauty of this also is that it makes it really quick and fast to iterate on things. So today's lab is going to focus on the tooling really suited for exploratory analysis, which is different than the tooling for explanatory. Um, when you're doing exploratory plots, you want to be able to create lots of charts very quickly and experiment with different visual encodings rather than have super full control custom ability of interaction and in every pixel by pixel layout. Um, that's why Python and R are more suited to exploratory analysis because you can get these charts uh, much faster. And I say exploratory analysis is optimizing this idea of time to insight. It's when you don't know the interesting things in your data and you really want to find out what and how to show your data. And then something like this, a explanatory visualization is all about time to interpretation. So when you're when you're building something like this, this definitely isn't like you sit down with a spreadsheet of weather data. The first thing you do isn't like, I really want to see what a polar chart with seven different layers looks like. 
Um, you can do that, but that's probably not going to help you as the data scientist or visualizer to figure out the data more. You're probably going to say, what's the average look like? What's a time series plot for things like the extreme values? What's the participation look like? Um, precipitation. And then once you've done a bunch of exploratory plots, you say, how do I synthesize these into one that I can communicate very effectively with? Um, Oh, so this is Hadley Wickham. If you see him around, um, say hi. He's not actually around here. Sometimes I'm, <laughs> I'm sure he visits, but he's a professor at Rice. Um, here is ggplot from YHAT. I'll put these links in the notes. The reason, so this is a semi-defunct library. It's a Python port of the ggplot2 library. So it has the exact same syntax. It's, I say, slightly defunct, mainly because it hasn't been, um, hasn't had any new commits since like early 2005. But the reason I'm going to put this in, in the notes is that it gives you a very quick overview of just the visual elements of the grammar of graphics. So we have things like um, area, bar, horizontal line, density, jitter. Now it's art. Um, then we have stats. So things like um, heat maps, some function, and some smoothing, and then facets, scales. They can be color scales. They can be log scales, continuous scales, categorical scales, and other things like aesthetics. So this is kind of a good, if you just want to like play around with the ideas of the grammar of graphics. Uh, and then... What we're going to be talking about is this library. Uh, has anyone seen Bokeh? I guess this is the home page. Has anyone used it? All right, so Bokeh is, I would say, Python's answer to D3. It's, um, again, I, I have some criticism, criticisms and critiques about it. Um, it's geared at and actually came out of this need to visualize a lot of data in very complex ways. So this actually excels where D3 and web-based technologies fall down in terms of being able to plot like a billion data points or something. Um, so this leverages Python and a lot of other complex processing to deal with large high dimensional data. Um, it came out of Continuum, the same folks that do a lot of the Python libraries. If you want to use it, you can either pip install it or you can conda install it. Um, I think that's it actually. Um, for reference, again, this is the site if you haven't been to it yet. Um, all the information's there. The videos are now up there on the playlist. You can see here they're in descending-ish order. Um, they're a little bit, I'll reorder these, um, but they're all numbered. And the videos are, are large, so I actually broke them up. So each lecture is numbered by the first number. So lecture three, and then if it has three parts, it's 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. Again, if anyone ever is just like, where's that thing I saw in class? Um, notes is the answer. Notes is always the answer. So if you're like, where's that thing? You click on notes and it basically gives you the index of everything. Um, for today, we're going to April 7th, grammar of graphics applied. Um, we can see here um, some notes on, on, on the lecture. The notebook is linked here. And the exercise that we'll be working through is all just in the description here. And resources, I always put the links from when I, when I show things in class at the bottom here. So if there's anything you've seen in class, it's going to end up here after lecture. I, I update these. Um, but if you do want to follow along with the notebook, you can go here. It brings you to the GitHub page. And you can download the notebook. Um, unfortunately, the, like, I, I didn't set up any browser-based thing, um, but I wanted to give you a quick demo. 
of Bokeh and talk about how it's different from something like matplotlib and, and pandas, and then we'll break and, and we'll get into the lab. Um, again, this is something like Python's answer to getting more complex, more interactive visualizations. It's come a long way since the initial first pass at, at what the library was maybe even like six months ago. Um, and as an example, so this is their default getting started example. It's nice because everything just outputs to IPython. But in this example here, we basically have X and Y. We just generate our own data. We have the same type of abstraction as matplotlib of the idea of a figure. So the figure is going to be our canvas that we put our, our layers in. In here, um, we can do title, X, Y labels. So we can see here in two lines of code, we get a nice kind of like interactive-y line chart, which uh, if we remember from D3, took about like 50 lines of JavaScript. So there are benefits to, to libraries like this. Um, the most of the layers actually are represented in almost like a single function here. So this concept of a layer is in these functions you call in the figure. In this case, p dot line, we give it the x, y, we give it a legend and a line width. So the line width can be thought of as the aesthetic. We can make things thicker or thinner. Um, and then we show it in the notebook. So that's just the, like, does bokeh work in my IPython notebook example? Um, but that's not super interesting. Um, what is interesting is when we start thinking about these charts in the grammar of graphics. And again, this is from Hadley Wickham's paper. And it's a really interesting quote. He basically starts off his paper and he says, why do we care about the grammar of graphics? And, and the points that, that he mentions here is that um, first off, the grammar is fundamental principles or rules of an art or science. So fundamental principles of how we think about graphics. So how do we decompose this? Um, a good grammar will allow us to gain insight into the composition of complex graphs. So if we're reading graphs, we can think about, oh, they really did the statistical transform well, or they really faceted well. Um, they give us a strong foundation to understand a diverse range of graphs. So in addition to being able to decompose one graph, like the weather example, we can also think of how do we combine these in interesting ways to get a plethora of various graphs. And then um, a grammar may help inform us on what good graphs mean. Um, here's just notes that um, are kind of mirrored on the board. And here's, again, from, from Hadley Wickham, a really oh, nice visual representation. Um, so this is from some tutorial on data science in R. Um, so if you do want to see this correspondingly mapped in, in um, R, the, the exercises are here that, that Hadley made. But the reason I like this, this graphic so much um, is that it starts off with this very um, tabular format, which everyone knows to be a spreadsheet. And through these very, um, I would say, formal processes, turns it into something that we take for granted of a colored bar chart. So the way to go from spreadsheet to colored bars is first, in this case, there's actually an aggregation. It's, it's something of a histogram. So you apply a statistical transform. We go from all of these bars to just three bars. We then apply a color scale mapping, and then we apply the bar aesthetic in the um, linear Y and the categorical X. Um, so that's what, what we're going to do in Python. Um, here's the histogram code in R, which again, in ggplot, it conceptually feels much more um, much closer to this because this is Hadley's reinterpretation of the grammar of graphics and he also made ggplot so it makes sense that they map together um, but bokeh 
has a very similar uh, way to reason about things. And the other, I guess the nice thing about Bokeh, I'll, I'll stop criticizing it, is that it gives us these two representations. It also can suck in pandas, seaborn, and matplot libplots. So if you do have plots in those, you can basically give them to uh, Bokeh, and it can make them interactive in a sense. But the nice thing about it is it gives us these two abstractions. It gives us the high-level abstraction of a chart. So it gives us this, but it also allows us, when we need to, to go down to the grammar of graphics. So we kind of get a little best of both worlds here. And um, I'm using this, this data set that's built in. Have you guys worked with the car data set before? It's like one of the more common uh, machine learning data sets because it has interesting um, properties. And in here, we basically just give it a one line call to the chart of histogram. So it says, here's our data frame of the auto MPG. We want to visualize the horsepower column. Here's the title and the legend goes in the top right. Uh, the legend got a little messed up there. Um, so if we do want to do this, we can get really rapid charts. But if we do want to go a little bit lower from the histogram um, into interesting, so this is what it looks like when we start applying or decomposing in the grammar of graphics. Um, so I'll just explain different things about this one is we have different bar colors. We have this, this hover. We have a different background. We, in theory, could scale it differently. Um, so this one's actually scaled on the Y as absolute counts. And this one is scaled as um, normalized counts. And I'll, I'll spend pretty much all the time just talking about this because um, it's the most interesting. But we start off with um, creating our canvas again. And in this, we add our annotation. And the way that Bokeh does these interactive tools is that it's kind of this like progressive enhancement, which makes it, makes it pretty powerful. We specify all the tools we want in this list. So we say we want the box select tool and the hover tool. Um, if you go on the, the Bokeh docs, I linked to some below this. There's basically this laundry list of do you want to be able to have brushable charts? Do you want um, lasso select? Do you want linked charts? Do you want all of these things? Uh, you basically just pass them in this tools, and it adds them automatically. The statistical transforms in Bokeh, they actually take an interesting approach, and they don't try to reinvent the wheel. They offload it to NumPy and SciPy. So whereas the grammar of graphics and um, or ggplot and even things like seaborn do regressions for you. You basically say like, I want to do a linear regression plot and you do the regression, you fit the line, you show me the confidence bounds. Um, in Bokeh, you, for better or worse, use what Python libraries are best for those certain transformations. Um, in this case, we're using NumPy and we're creating a histogram. So histogram, Again, it's a statistical transform. It's a count. Um, the benefit of using NumPy is that we get to specify and use all of the parameters of, of NumPy's histogram. So we can normalize it. We can set the number of bins. We can do very fine-grained statistical transforms. And what gets returned from that, we can then pass to our geometry. So very much like, uh, like this. We basically first apply a statistical transform, then we apply some mapping, then we visualize. We do that in code here by first applying a statistical transform, then applying our geometry and mapping all in one. And in this case, we don't actually have to explicitly pass in scales. And then we show it and we get our chart here. Um, and that's that's the kind of quick and dirty of how Bokeh implements the, the grammar of graphics. But does anyone um, have questions on this code? This code actually touches on one of each of the concepts in Bokeh. Um, for each of these, there's 
again, like a whole laundry list of things. There's a whole laundry list of interactions. There's a whole laundry list of geometries. There's a whole laundry list of statistical transforms. But with these, we can compose and make any, most any chart um, that we might want. Uh, here. That is, oh, that's the bar geom. Um, yeah, so it, it's a little uh, weird in, in bokeh. I'll, I'll show some of the other glyphs. So they call their geoms glyphs, and they're a little bit lower level than what ggplot says is geoms. So in here we have circle glyphs, we have square glyphs, but then we also, um, here's the list of things. You can also get things like cross, triangle, square cross, diamond cross, asterisk, or even define custom polygons. So we can have a glyph that represents a custom polygon. And then the really powerful thing about this, which we can actually do in, in ggplot and most, most everything is, where is it? This idea of composite glyphs or charts. So you can imagine, um, uh, oh yeah, there's not a better example, but you can imagine each of these, let's say they actually, instead of being a donut, actually are a pie chart. And you could represent each one of your data points by its own pie chart. So if this is something like states on a map, instead of having the data for each state be a single number, you can represent a distribution of numbers. So you can basically compose and layer these to have a map where each state has its own pie chart built in. Um, questions on bokeh and again bokeh is pretty powerful and it is something that for projects going forward you can use you don't have to do every project actually in d3 um, i will say it, it will take a lot of work in something like bokeh to do projects two and three but it is something that you can use other if you're really great with ggplot2 and you want to submit a example um, for your project in it, by all means, that's totally fine. Um, hopefully, the projects are set up such that it's best and easiest to, to do them in D3. But um, again, not exclusive. Bokeh is, is a good alternative. All right, yeah, if no one has, has questions, we'll, we'll get into the lab, which is where hopefully more questions will, will come up. I'll, I'll go over the exercise quickly. Um, so the exercise for people who are listening is going to be doing well, at least half the class laughed, which means half of you are listening and half of you don't find me funny. Um, so we're going to be working with this inside Airbnb data. It's again, I hope it doesn't feel like I'm beating this dead horse. But with visualization, I think the things that make for good, interesting data are both ones that have a lot of context behind it. So especially lately, there's been a lot of interest in taking a more like analytical approach of studying how these sharing economy companies actually affect civic organizations in the city at large. So Airbnb, it's basically its own hotel industry and Uber is its own taxi industry and Lyft is its own separate taxi industry. So how do these actually affect things like civic policy? Um, so it's interesting data. The other good thing is that it's relatively clean. So we're not going to need to do any data munging. And the third interesting thing is that it's, I think I only show 18 cities here, but the developer who collected it, collected on like 30-ish cities. So it's something where for this lab, each of you is going to get a different city. So 
pair up with the person immediately next to you. Um, all of you, there's no extra person, I don't think, unless someone came in late after. But anyways, groups of three are okay. Um, so I'll assign each of you a city. And then the lab is broken up into two parts. Um, the first part is working with pandas. Again, there's probably less direction in, in this intentionally than we've seen in the class so far. Um, it's basically a laundry list of questions that you should use pandas, or I mean, if you want to do it in R, do it in R to answer, such as for each city, um, how many neighborhoods are there? What's the most common room type? What's the neighborhood with the most listings? Um, so this first part is a bunch of point statistics. The second part is visualizing those point statistics in, in plots. And then the last three questions here are basically doing these more advanced statistical transforms. Um, and the end is actually doing stuff with Seaborn. I linked to the documentation in the examples. Um, Rather than explaining a lot of Seaborn, for people, it sounds like you've worked with it. It basically feels like panda plots. Um, so not anything super new, um, maybe slightly different syntax. And the thing that is going to need some explanation um, is these two questions here, five and six. And the kind of overarching idea of this is, um, has anyone here heard of Prop F? So Prop F is this thing, if you've been in the city in the past six months, Airbnb put up a lot of ads and billboards. It was basically the city saying, we're going to tax you, Airbnb. And Airbnb had this really hostile response and put up like passive aggressive ads of like, oh, so-and-so. And, -so, and like, we're, we would fund this, but we're giving money to that. And it was a big kind of mess. But it seems like the city and, and Airbnb are, are on good terms. But the interesting thing about it was they wanted to limit what Airbnb listings or what type of listings could be on Airbnb and what type of listings should be considered a hotel. And this is kind of a lot of what, what the context behind the Airbnb, inside Airbnb data is, is um, Prop F said, if you're renting out your entire home for more than 75 days out of the year, you're a hotel and you should get taxed like a hotel. Um, Airbnb came back and they said, oh no, that's not right. Like things are complicated. Um, but question five and six basically say, what would it look like for each of these respective other cities if they also enacted Prop F type bills? So if all of the listings in the Airbnb or in the city were removed that had availability more than 75 days, what impact to Airbnb would that have and how many listings would get removed? And in terms of the impact, um, I say kind of vaguely calculate revenue. Um, so there's, there's no way to get an absolute metric of, of revenue, but the columns of interest are reviews per month, availability, and price. So you're not going to get docked if you don't do this right. But my approach, if I were doing this, would be, all right, based on my own experience, maybe half or 75% of the people who leave reviews, actually, or of the people that stayed, leave reviews. So the reviews per month is 50 to 75% of the people who stayed. And then you can times that by the availability. And then you can multiply that by the price per night to get some idea of how much revenue each of these listings makes per year. Um, 